I, I've been reading a lot in Hebrews, and I, and I want to share something with you tonight. So if you would stand with me, I'm going to read my text out of Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. And it says, Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord God, I pray tonight that you be with me as I deliver this message. I know it's not about me, God. It's all about you. And I want to do a good job for you tonight, God. I pray that this lesson makes sense to me, but I want it to make sense to everyone that's hearing it tonight, God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Anoint me, Lord God. Allow this message to go forth and lay heavy on the hearts of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. You may be seated. All right. So, Sister Celeste, how are you tonight? Always gives me joy when I see Sister Celeste walk through the door. Have you ever embarked upon something, and a few weeks into it, you begin to question whether it was the right choice? For some of you, maybe it was a relationship. I've had one or two of those a long time ago. Or that perfect job, you thought. We're starting some fad diet. But those are small things. I'm thinking more about life-altering decisions. I guess the closest thing I can think of to what I'm trying to convey tonight would be when I joined the military. That was a life-altering decision I made. When I was a senior at Beaver Local High School, September 1987, I joined the military. My father had several conversations with me prior to that point. He told me if I wanted to go to college, I would have to fund it myself. I had 14 siblings. My father was an Army in the Army Reserves at the time. My older brother, Tim, had joined the Army National Guard. And as a result, he was getting his college paid for because of that decision. And he made it through Army basic training and the Army Corps of Engineers training. Um, so I figured if he could do it, certainly I could. But I really didn't see myself as a military, military man. Uh, perhaps there was another way I could fund my college, I thought. Well, I wasn't a stellar student, like my wife and kids. Uh, so scholarships weren't the answer for me. And selling snow cones and milkshakes in the summer on my dad's ice cream truck wasn't going to pay tuition either. So I did it. I finally decided I, too, would join the military. But I did what I, I didn't want to do it the way my older brother Tim did it, you know. He, he had his path, and I wanted to have my path. And there were two National Guard units in Austintown, Ohio. One was an engineer unit, which my brother was a member, and I didn't want to be in his unit with him. The other one was a military police unit. So at 17, my parents went with me to the recruiter's office. My dad gleefully signed on the dotted line. My mother, though, was reluctant about it. She didn't like the idea of her little Ricky joining the military. And as a 17-year-old, your parents have to sign for you. You're not old enough to sign for yourself. So it was done. I was now in the military, September 1987. I'm sorry, 1986 it would have been. And I had eight months to think about it because I was still a senior in high school. And I did. Constantly I thought about it. I finally graduated on June 7, 1987, and I took off for basic training seven days later on June 14th. And I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. We're having problems with our sound system, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> My parents drove me to Youngstown, the Youngstown Greyhound Station. And I rode a bus to Cleveland that night. Early the next morning, I took a second physical, signed a few more documents, did a lot of standing around, and finally it was wheels up. I was on my way to Atlanta, Georgia, 
A ride would be bused about an hour and a half west to a place called Fort McClellan, Alabama. I was still 17, would not turn 18 until July 15th of the summer of 87. And this was my first time I had ever left my home for an extended period of time without my parents. We arrived after midnight after a long day of travel. I was tired, I was nervous, I was excited all at the same time. And we were greeted by Army drill sergeants when we arrived. And even though they were stern, they were not as mean as what I was told they would be. But that was because I was at the reception station. And I would stay there for about 10 days. At the reception station, they gave us shots and issued us our uniforms and all of our equipment. They made us stand in a lot of lines. They gave us all kinds of busy work to do. Wouldn't let us talk to anyone. We had to run everywhere we went. We were provided one phone call home just to let our parents know we arrived safely. And they were pretty much just keeping us busy until we had enough people to form a company and start basic training. We got three meals a day, which weren't bad at all. I used to say my favorite three times of the day in the Army were breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> they got us up super early in the morning and put us to bed at 9 o'clock at night. And after about a week, I started to get homesick. I missed my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my girlfriend, who would eventually dump me. And I just wanted to get out of the reception station and get started with what I came there to do. And that was to complete my training and get back home so I could start to college. You know, I, of course, I was in the reserves. I wasn't active duty, so I wasn't going anywhere after training. I was just simply coming home. But it was going to be about a four or five month process before that would happen. So finally we had 150 personnel, enough to form a company. They loaded us onto cattle cars. Does anyone here know what a cattle car is? It's just a big trailer with one little window in it and they jam about 60 or 70 soldiers in the back of a cattle car that is meant for cattle and they bus you around post in these cattle cars. We're all jammed in there. Each recruit, recruit had two duffel bags, one on your front, one on your back. It was hot, it was smelly, and we were packed in there like sardines. We drove what seemed like a really long time. I kept thinking, where in the world are they taking us? But I later found out we were only two miles from the reception station when they dropped us off. They had driven us around in circles to make us think we had they had taken us somewhere really far away from civilization. Finally, the cattle car came to a stop, and I could hear voices outside. Then it got real quiet. Suddenly, the doors violently swung open. There were drill sergeants everywhere. They were screaming at the top of their lungs. Some of them were acting like absolute maniacs. I had never seen anything like it. They said, you have five seconds to get off this cattle car. We all tripped over each other to get off that trailer as quickly as possible. We fumbled around to keep a hold of our belongings, stay out of the way of those loud, maniacal drill sergeants and follow orders. The situation only became more chaotic. Soon drill sergeants were focusing on me, screaming and spitting in my face. At one point, I was pushed backwards into a pile of other soldiers. Hold your bags above your head. Lower them. Hold your bags above your head. Lower them. Up the stairs. Down the stairs. Up the stairs. Down the stairs. It was hot, muggy, Alabama morning around 10 a.m. The uniforms were long sleeve. I had boots on. I wasn't used to wearing boots. I didn't grow up wearing boots. My pants were bloused into my boots. That's something else I wasn't used to. I was uncomfortable. I was sweating profusely. I was thirsty. And these drill sergeants were showing no signs of slowing down. And I could go on and on with this story. My kids know I love to tell it. However, I have a lesson to teach, and the purpose of this little digression to my lesson was to hopefully make a point. During those first couple of weeks of Army basic training, I was scared. I was suffering. And I was doing a lot of soul searching. I was seriously beginning to question if I made the right decision. Was this going to be worth it? Was college tuition really worth all this harassment? Oh, how I wanted to be back home during those first few weeks. 
I can remember even having dreams at night that I was back home, eating dinner around the dining room table, cutting the grass even, drinking an ice-cold sweet tea that my mother used to make so well, only to be rudely awakened by a trash can bouncing down the aisle between the rows of bunks, drill sergeants waking us up at 4.30 in the morning. It was just a dream. I'm not back home sipping on ice-cold sweet tea. I'm in Army basic training. I can remember waking up feeling that way, thinking I was actually at home, just to be reminded I was not. You know, it may seem funny now, but I assure you it was not funny then. But believe it or not, this is a great segue into my lesson this evening. Now, about those three scriptures I read at the beginning of the story, from the book of Hebrews. An interesting aspect about the book of Hebrews is we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some think it was the Apostle Paul. I tend to think it was the Apostle Paul. However, Paul did write 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, but Paul doesn't introduce himself at the beginning of Hebrews like he does all the other letters he wrote. He always says, me, the Apostle Paul. He introduces himself. But in Hebrews, nobody does that. Some theorize maybe it was Barnabas that wrote, Paul, uh, that wrote uh, Hebrews or Apollos or Priscilla and Aquila. Maybe it was a joint thing that they wrote. We simply do not know. There are other possible authors that have been thrown around that could have wrote the book of Hebrews. We can only speculate. But one thing we know for sure is that the writer of the book of Hebrews was trying to encourage discouraged Jewish Christians. And at this point in the book of Hebrews, which I just read, the writer is trying to convince his readers or listeners, because it reads like a sermon more than a letter, that Jesus Christ is a compassionate, sympathetic, and helpful high priest. Now, to you and me, the concept of a high priest may mean very little. We live in a different time and a different culture, but to these first century Jewish Christians, the idea of a high priest was very familiar to them. It's how they were raised and what they believed. It was their heritage. They understood that in some way they connected to God through the high priest. The book of Hebrews is believed to have been written about 30 or so years after the day of Pentecost when, when the apostle Peter gave his famous Acts 2.38 message. So these are first and second generation Christians that we're dealing with in the book of Hebrews. And just like my initial military experience, these folks had embarked upon something new, a Christian faith as opposed to the older and more prevalent Judaism, which was their heritage. And they were beginning to question their decision. They were enduring some hard times, some discomfort. They were suffering. And just like me at age 17 while at Army basic training, they, dare I say, were considering going back to Judaism. And the writer of this book spends much of his time talking about sticking with the faith, staying in there, not giving up. And I think this is important to discuss because no different than these first century Christians, we Christians of the 21st century often experience these very same thoughts. If we're honest with ourselves, we would admit that at certain junctures of our walk with the Lord, we have considered, considered questioning our faith. I have questioned at times in my life. Life's frustrations, they can wear on us. We experience hardships, some discomfort, a little bit of suffering, and we're ready to go AWOL from the army. And in talking to these discouraged Jewish Christians, the writer incorporates the practices of the Jewish priest. As Jewish believers, the writer knew this would resonate with his audience. So Hebrews 4 and 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast, our profession. Notice how the writer emphasizes that we not only have a priest, but we have a high priest. In fact, he adds greater emphasis by saying, we have a great high priest. From the time of when this system was instituted during the exodus from Egypt until the temple was destroyed by Romans in 70 AD, 
the high priest had the role and responsibility of going before God on behalf of the people. And the priest interceded on behalf of the people. And the high priest had the assignment of going into the temple, into the inner courts, ultimately the holies of holies, the innermost chamber. And he would take with him the blood of the sacrifice and pour it on the altar so that the sins of the people would be forgiven. And verse 13, which I didn't read, makes a startling statement as it leads into verse 14. Verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him which whom we have to do. So this verse causes you to stop and think. Quietness will come over the crowd when you come to the realization that there is a God you cannot escape, you cannot hide from. The scripture says not only can we, we not hide from him, but all things are naked and opened unto him. I can remember when I was a kid, my mother used to say, oh, you might get away with something that I don't find out about, but there's someone watching you, everything you do. The scripture's not talking about a physical nakedness here, but the nakedness and openness of God knowing everything about you, every thought, every desire, every intention, every motive, every idle word, everything we are and do is naked and open to God. He knows everything about us. We cannot hide. And there are professed Christians, Christians who openly live sinful lives. You may see them in church on Sunday and then see them leave in a bar Monday, early Monday morning. Or, and then there are professed Christians who appear to live a clean and righteous life but struggle secretly with pornography or, or secretly stealing money from their employer. But the fact is, both are seen clearly by God. And the writer in Hebrews chapter 13 is saying, God sees it all. He sees your heart. He sees your thoughts. He sees your desires. He hears the words that come out of your mouth. The things you look at when nobody's around, he sees it all, all of it. And the scariest part of all of this is that not only does he see it all, but he says that one day we will have to stand before God and give an account for it. This is a horrifying thought. I've done some things in my life I'm ashamed of. I'm not very proud of. I wasn't born saved like some folks. That's a joke. I've made many errors and mistakes. I've made questionable decisions. And many of these since I've been saved. And this is why verse 14 is so significant. If the chapter would have ended at verse 13, this would be a horrible thing. God sees all that we do and we must give an account for it. But he doesn't stop at verse 13. The writer goes on in verse 14 and says that we have a great high priest. These first century Christians, they understood the purpose of a high priest. This resonated with them and it should resonate with us today. Because when we place our faith and confidence in Jesus Christ and we obey the gospel of repentance, being baptized in his precious name, receiving his spirit, living inside of us, just as Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, we identify with our great high priest. He became the perfect and final sacrifice for all. His blood washed away our sins. And we can now be assured of our salvation if we continue steadfastly in this wonderful gospel. When Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood for us, there was no longer a need for animal sacrifices. His blood was sufficient to cover, cover all of our sins, past, present, and future sins. Now, does this give us a license to sin? Absolutely not. But if we slip up and fall, we can get back up. We can go boldly to his throne of grace. And if we are truly repentant, he will forgive us. And that should make you shout, church, that we can be forgiven when we fall. Verse 14 says, seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Our high priest came from heaven. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our high priest came down through glory. Through 40 and two generations, he was born of a virgin. His father wasn't Joseph. Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And it was by him and through him that all things were made. 
Before he came to the earth, he lived in glory. His abode was the throne of God. In the beginning was the Word. We've heard this before. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, our high priest, was God wrapped up in human form. He is a greater high priest. The high priest of the temple in Jerusalem passed through the curtains into the holies of holies, signifying being in the presence of God. But our great high priest, he passed through the heavens, and he sits on the right hand of God, having all power and authority. He is our great high priest, and for this reason, we should hold to our profession. So you can somewhat understand why these first-generation Christians may have had trouble grasping this. The priests they were raised with came from the tribe of Levi, descendants of Aaron. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of David. How could he be a priest? This was a new concept for them. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to convey to them that this Christian doctrine, this gospel of Jesus Christ, represented a new system, a better system. No more animal sacrifices. Jesus shedding his blood on the cross was the final and perfect sacrifice for all. And verse 15 goes on to open even more revelation. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now to the ancient Greeks and many other heathen nations back then, the idea of a compassionate God was unthinkable. Gods didn't have time for messy human feelings. They did as they pleased, regardless of the impact of their human subjects. But that's not the God we serve. Our God is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Our God added humanity to his deity. Jesus wept. Jesus laughed. Jesus loved. He experienced pain and weariness, sadness, anger. And as a result, he understands our pain, our weaknesses, and our troubles. We serve a compassionate God, a compassionate high priest. Compassion was a requirement for the priest of ancient Israel. When an Israelite sinned, he would bring a goat or a lamb to the priest. This was a sacrifice. It was meant to be a sacrifice. If you didn't have animals, you had to purchase an animal, and it cost money to purchase an animal. If you did have animals, you had to pick of the best of your flock. You couldn't take that sickly lamb that was about to die and bring that to the priest. That would have been rejected. You had to pick one without spot, without blemish. You had to bring a perfect lamb to the priest. And you would bring this perfect lamb to the priest, and the priest would inspect it. Have you ever watched those dog shows? I forget. What's the famous dog show? The one over in Europe. Oh, I thought you'd know this, Kelly. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I've seen them before, you know, have you ever seen that judge get down there and they run their hands over the hip and the legs and they're looking at making sure that dog is perfect. That all goes in the grading of a dog. Well, it's sort of what the priest did for these lambs and these goats when they would bring them in. They would inspect these goats and lambs and make sure that they weren't sick, that they didn't have any deformities. And if it passed inspection, it would be accepted. Then the priest would have you lay your hands on the head of that lamb, and you would confess your sins before the priest. And in a sense, through confession, you were transferring your transgressions, your sins, onto that innocent lamb. And as the priest would watch you do this, listen to you confess your sins, you would hope that he had a heart of compassion, that he was praying for your forgiveness. That, he would, that you would be loosed from the bondage of your sins in doing so. And you would hope that he wasn't thinking, oh, here we go again. Here's that loser bringing me another lamb back again this month, still bound to that same sin he came here for last time. Let's get on with this. There's a whole line of people that got to bring their sacrifice. That's not how the priest executed their mission. They had a, they had a compassion 
The priest was expected to be compassionate. The priests of those days were born of men, and they too were sinners. They too had to make sacrifices for the atonement of their sins before they could make sacrifices for the people of Israel. When God became flesh and walked among us as Jesus Christ, the scripture says he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This fact makes him a better high priest. The high priest who came down through the tribe of Levi, through the family of Aaron, they all had sin. We all have sin. I don't care how long you've been saved, how long you've been coming to church, we all have sin. You might think that you can save yourself from your sin. You might think that you can will yourself from that thing you are doing. You might think you can beat that addiction that, you, that has you bound. But the truth of the matter is you can't. You can't. If you could, you would have done it by now. You might make a commitment and say, no more. I'm not going to mess with it again. But when that weak moment comes, you give in. And you don't do it small either. You go in all the way. And it's sad. It's tragic. But we have a great high priest. He understands. He doesn't excuse, but he understands. He can sympathize with our weaknesses and our temptations, but he cannot and will not sympathize with our sin. We serve a God who understands. He was in all points tempted as we are. You may not believe that, but he was. In fact, he was tempted in greater ways than we are, yet without sin. We can live holy because he did. We can live free because he did. His Holy Ghost gives us the power, the strength, and the anointing to make the right choices and deliver us from our sin and live holy because he did. And because of this, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. We can't deliver ourselves from our sins, but he can deliver us from our sins. He's given us access. That's what this scripture is telling us. Verse 16 says, we have access to the king, to the high priest. He's made provision, opened up a door where we can go directly to the throne of God. We no longer need to go through a human priest or through some rich. You can go to God directly for ourselves. Do you understand how blessed we are? For those of you that have prayer lives, and I'm assuming all of you do, don't take for granted how blessed you are to be able to fall down on your knees in your prayer closet and just pour your heart out to God. And he hears us. We don't have to go through a, a human priest. Sure, we can call our pastor and share our troubles and please pray for this and pray for that. And he'll do that because he's a compassionate pastor. But we have the ability to go directly to God with our problems. And that's a, an amazing blessing. That's an amazing blessing. We can find our closet in our home and fall on our knees and have direct access to an almighty God who will hear us. No more animals, animal sacrifices for our sin. No more going before a human priest. If we make a mistake, we come boldly unto the throne of grace by ourselves and repent and God we will obtain compassion from a God that loves us. We'll obtain mercy and grace in our time of need. It's what the Bible says. That's what the scripture says. That's the type of God we serve, a compassionate God, a great high priest, one who can sympathize with our weaknesses, one who has given us access to his throne of grace and offers mercy and grace in our time of need. This is, this is wonderful, powerful scripture here. Something you should latch on to and tell yourself over and over again. It's what the writer of Hebrews was trying to, to convey to his subjects in the first century. And it's a message that applies to the people today in the 21st century. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And I just, I just want all of us right now, let's just lift our hands and give our high priest praise. Hallelujah, Lord God. We offer up praise to you, God. Honor and glory, Lord Jesus. You are the Almighty, the great high priest. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, the ability.
to have direct access to you, Lord God, in our time of need every day, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, we don't take that lightly, oh God. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let's hang on, church. Let's don't give up. Let's hold fast to our profession because we have a great high priest. So I'm going to turn it back over to Brother Waddell, and he can say what he has to say. <laughs>